I would like to welcome everybody to my first interview at uh, Courage Rises with Susan Jeffries. I am Susan Jeffries, and um, I am starting a practice, and I call it a practice because this is my first one, and um, we're going to you know, evolve as it goes along. So um, my practice around courage and bravery, and uh, my intent is to share content um, with you uh, around the subject of cur uh, courage and bravery, and it might be an interview with someone I know to be courageous or who has a great story to tell. It might be um, sharing a link with you of someone else who is um, you know, currently active in this uh, domain, this sphere of courage. Uh, so uh, it will be a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But anyway, I hope you enjoy this. Um, I want to introduce you to my good friend, Donna Dunn. Donna and I met, I run a networking, uh, a chapter of a networking group. It's called Seven Networking. Uh, we're on Zoom on Fridays. And Donna is one of the stars of Seven Networking because there are about seven or eight meetings during the week. And I think she goes to all of them. Is that right, I, Donna? I do try. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we've gotten to know each other. So Donna, um, tell us basically kind of who you are, where you live, that kind of thing. Hey, well, my name is Donna Dunn. I live in uh, Pennsylvania, so I'm all totally on the East Coast, and Suki's on the West Coast. Um, I am a uh, mom. I'm a widow. I'm a cancer survivor. I'm someone full of uh, gusto. I own my own business. I started my own business three years ago. Actually, starting four years ago now. It's like, wow, it's gone so fast. Wow. So um, just someone who's trying to make a life for myself. Very good. Very good. And I, I know you and I know that you are quite successful at making a life for yourself. So Donna, if you don't mind me asking, how old are you? I am 60. 60. Okay. So yeah. you and I are about the same age. I'm 61. So um, when I brought up the subject of courage or bravery, um, it resonated with you and you reached out to me and said, yeah, I'll talk to you about that. So do you have specific instances that you want to talk about or is it just a way of living for you? It's actually a part of living, but it's because of the fact that um, my late husband and I both had cancer basically at the same time. Wow. And he had it, came out of it. I went into mine. I came out of mine. He went back into his. I went to the reconstruction part of mine and came barely out of that. And he went back into his last work about. So I think the two of us were just courageous raising our kids because we didn't let them know we were sick, sick. They knew wow. we were, I had two children at that point. One was four and one was nine and, or eight, eight, I'm sorry. Um, and at that point we just said, mom's sick, dad's sick. And we had a rule of whoever was sick was not the disciplinarian. Somebody else was just so that they would never notice the difference. Um, but I had to prove to my girls that no matter how sick we were, mom is always going to be fine or dad's going to be fine. And we kept trying and working on that. So we kept the household laughing and craziness, even though we were losing body parts or going through the chemo or whatever it is. And then when, unfortunately, with our four-year battle, he passed away, I then had to raise my eight-year-old and 13-year-old by myself and figure out how I was going to do this because he's the breadwinner. I work nights in a grocery store just to have extra money for us to try to help us. So I then had to find, figure out what was I going to do to raise my kids and how was I going to make that look and then still stay cancer free because I hadn't hit my five year mark at all. Mm -hmm. So I was only at three years and I had to make it through to be feeling like I was okay. And so that was something I do with my girls constantly. I just found a new job. Um, I went from working at night to day in the grocery store and got a slight management position doing that. Um, and then from there, I went into saying, well, the store closed down. We had to find something else. I love kids. And that was all I wanted to be was a housewife and a mother. So I said, okay, got to be something with kids. And I'd been a Girl Scout leader forever. So I said, all right, we're going to go into teaching. So I went to start teaching in um, for a preschool, one school, and that didn't have insurance. So I went to another school that, and started a whole new thing until 
because I had to cover insurance on myself. And we just did. We just struggled to figure out how to make those pennies stretch as far as we could stretch them and keep going and keep the kids happy and pretending like life was okay when I'm falling apart. But I tried to say that wasn't it. You know, like we just, you had no choice. I had to raise my kids. I had to keep going. Right. And that is, um, you know, I'm familiar with that uh, paradigm. My, my father died when I was five and uh, my mom uh, had skills. She was a registered nurse and, and she had to go and uh, get a job to support our family. So um, yeah, I understand the must do something to keep my family alive uh, thing. What it sounds like along the way you, um, you really had to figure out what it is that you liked. Um, you know, you were forced into a couple of situations. Your husband died, you had to get a job, you had to take care of your kids. The store closed, you had to get um, another kind of job. I'm, I'm interested, did you have a process in figuring out how to get that next job and how to go into teaching? I mean, that must have been a scary thing. It was just basically, I love kids and I didn't have a degree. I never went to college. Mm -hmm. So, and what they were, they were started out as daycares, but the schools I went to were more education. So they weren't babysitting. It was teaching. And that part of me just resonated so that I was able to do that, fortunately. Mm -hmm. And when I came to the one that actually is down the street from me, and I worked at that one for three and a half years, I went in with the premise of switching it from a babysitting service kind of idea to we're going in to learn. And unfortunately, the director at that point passed away as I joined in there. So I just took on the lead that she told me to do, which so I just transferred my classroom that way. And so I was just, I had no choice, I thought. I, there's nothing else I could do. I didn't know what else I could do. I didn't have an education for anything else. Kids were my thing. So mm -hmm. if it was going to be something with kids, I was going to do it. I eventually left them and went to a different one that I stayed at until I left it after 11, a little over 11 years to be open my own business. Yeah, gosh. But yeah, at that point, I did get a degree, a small degree. I mean, I got my CDA, mm -hmm. you know, which is small. Half of what is that? Degrees. What is the CDA? It's half of a, like an associate's degree. Okay. For teaching. Mm -hmm. Right. So I at least got that in to do stuff. But, and I, and I determined my children saying, all right, I worked all day. I had to come home and do this online at night, plus raise the kids at the same time. I thought, this is insane. <laughs> well, but you have to do what you have to do. <laughs> you do. Have you always had the kind of energy that I know you to have now? Yeah, I was a tomboy growing up. And so I was always climbing into trees and swinging around. Um, one of six kids, three boys, three girls. And so we're always ramming each other around in the neighborhood. So always very energetic. Um, I wasn't always outgoing personally when it, the adults with kids in a heartbeat yeah adults are my thing and i just i've had to evolve this which mm -hmm. i credit seven networking a lot for that for that for me yeah and i feel like um there are a lot of people certainly that um take courageous steps because they feel they there's no other choice um but that's still a brave step, I think. Um, you, the other choice is to sit on the couch and wallow in self-pity. I mean, did you have any moments or periods of time, a lot of people will go through a bit of a depression or a funk um, because of the decision they have to make and they're maybe a little bit afraid of it. All I did is, I didn't allow myself that and I think it's because I'm a cancer survivor. Mm -hmm. because the whole process through Michael and my cancer, sorry, was that nobody could ever come into our rooms if they were going to cry. You had to be upbeat. You had to be laughing. And we made jokes about every part that we were losing that we yeah. could, we could build another body by the parts that we were losing. <laughs> I mean, so we had to stay upbeat and we kept it that way. i never wanted my children to be afraid of what was going on. I mean, we didn't know he was going to pass, the night he passed until that day when I took him in, mm -hmm. I was supposed to have more time and we were going to explain it to the girls finally because we finally had the results of it's not working anymore. This is finally it. And I never got that chance to tell them that. Right. So I had to work this process when I was in the car. Every day in the car, when I came back from someplace or on the way to work, I'd fall apart completely in the car and then be fine when I got back into the house or into whatever building I was going into. 
because I wasn't allowing myself to let anybody else see that. But I, of course I had my moments. It was always in a car. I mean, I was always in the car doing something. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it sounds like, as you said earlier, it was kind of a courage and bravery, kind of a lifelong practice for you. Did you think of it that way when you were making those decisions? Did you think this is a brave and bold move? No, I just thought I was trying to move forward. <laughs> I was trying to survive. I literally, I promised my late husband on his deathbed that I would get the girls to 21 alive and safe. Didn't know how I was going to do it, but I was going to make them both get there and I'd figure it out after, and I just would figure it out. And so it wasn't an option for me. I, and I came from a very strong mother. Not that my father wasn't, but my mother's a very strong woman. And I totally believe I got my determination was from her. It's, the Sicilian in me is just really strong about, you don't give in. You just do what you have to do because you have to do it. Yeah. I, you and I share so many experiences, cancer survivor, I had a very strong mother's way. Well, she passed away from Alzheimer's last February. And, um, uh, but I talk uh, at her funeral, I talked about, um, actually it was called the power of yes, was what I called my eulogy to her. And it was all about saying yes to life, uh, you know, where you could just kind of retreat. And I mean, it sounds like you didn't just make decisions to keep you alive. You made decisions that allowed you to thrive. And um, I think that that is um, a, a very uh, brave thing to do because it could have, you know, it could have been a totally different experience for you and your girls. And I think they're very lucky that you chose to thrive and you chose to make things good for them. For them. Thank you. <laughs> so if you wanted to share something with uh, my very small audience at this point, <laughs> about courage or bravery what would you what would you tell them that you really are stronger than you think you are you really it's it, and I never thought about it as more than I had no choice yeah you, you can't crumple up and die not when you have little kids I am grateful that I had the kids because that was my reason to get up every morning I had no choice I had to get them off to school I had to raise them and take care of them there wasn't an option. There's nobody else here. So it was me because I live in Pennsylvania and my family lives in New Jersey. So I had to raise them. So it wasn't an option there. And I thought, okay, how are we going to do this? And I just did what I thought I had to do. I wasn't, I didn't get a chance to think about it. It was just, just do it. And I had great support from my friends. Oh, I, mean, that's wonderful. I mean, amazing friends who were there through the whole process, who never left my side, checked on me constantly. And at one point, I was, my kids were eating macaroni and cheese and hot dogs nonstop. And all of a sudden, one day, a bag of groceries ended up at my side door. I had no idea where they came from. To this day, I still have no idea where those came from. But they were groceries sitting at my side door. And I was like, okay. I was like, thank you, Lord. And so I always try to pay it forward because somebody paid it forward to me. So yeah. I try to do that with my girls, tell them the same thing. That's absolutely beautiful. So at this point, I was going to wrap it up and thank Donna for being my first guest. And I started asking her how she liked the process of being interviewed and stuff. And there was just so much good stuff to come that I just continued. When asked the questions, it's easier than trying to talk because I'm trying to write the book right now. So I'm trying to think that through. It's like, how do you think those questions through? So it works. <laughs> yeah. You said you're braver than you think you are. Um, any advice? on making, uh, being braver, being more courageous? I think is you have to get out of your own way. Being one of six, my older siblings are very smart people. And not that, and the ones below me are very smart people. I think school was not my thing. I was a B, C, D person. And I, you know, I had A, B people ahead of me. And behind me and it's like but I thought you know what I may be street smart I'll be life smart I'm just not book smart it's just not my thing mm -hmm. and so I've taught my girls the same thing that they need to be strong they need to learn how to figure things out especially after Michael passed away because he used to do everything and I would work with him but mm -hmm. he did everything and so I had to learn how to do everything and my mantra was we don't need a male to do this 
we can do this. Mm -hmm. We'll figure it out. And so when any guy would always, and I appreciate my friends, but I'm like, let me try to figure it out first. If I can't, I'll ask you. Yeah. And I had a lot of husbands, you know, anytime I had to call a hubby, there was a hubby that's going to come help me. But I wanted my girls to realize we were strong. We were going to be able to handle whatever came down our way. We were going to figure this out. It's not going to always be easy. A lot of the time it wasn't. But if you think things through, you'll figure it out. And I, I wanted that lesson for my girls. And a silly story is that my oldest one, when she was at college, she had a paper she's supposed to write for philosophy on, you are now a single parent, you're raising three kids, you have a certain amount of money. How are you going to do it? She wrote the paper, called me up, she says, mom, tell me, da, 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 da. so I told her everything. She hands the paper in, and the her professor goes, there's no way this is what would help, you'd, you'd never survive. She goes, would you like to talk to my mother? Yeah. She said his mouth dropped, he couldn't believe that, you know. And said, okay, and she got a good grade. <laughs> but I said, and so she's lived on with that. She has used that when life has gotten tough for her. She's gone back to the lessons that we did together that I wasn't saying I was teaching the lessons, but they were just watching, yep. just like I watched my mother. It's just, they watched and they learned. So I have two very strong young women underneath, you know, from me, and I'm thrilled to death that, mm -hmm. you know, when I go, I know they're going to be fine because they're very strong. Yeah, you should be very proud of that. That's wonderful. Yeah, I'm really proud of them. I like the um, I like the theme of asking for help and uh, having a hubby on hand <laughs> when you needed it. Um, you know, I I am not naturally someone who asks for help, and I, I. <laughs> yeah, and I find because I figure I can do it myself. Uh, I found it until I was sick. Um, I found it very hard to ask for help, and now I find it a lot easier to ask for help because I've been in a situation where I needed it, and I, I found that. Uh, your friends are usually just dying to help you. They're like, what can I do for you? You know? Right. And they don't want to overtake you as much as you love your family. The family wants to overtake you and comfort you and, and wrap you up. Your friends want to lift you up and protect you and help you. But it's just because the family's nurtured you and, and then I'm the baby sister out of all the girls. So, you know, they want to do that. Mm -hmm. where my friends have known me as a strong person for everything I've done. Yeah. Different dynamics. Mm -hmm. And so the friends are there to help lift you because they've seen you go through so much. That's why they have been amazing. And they're still to this day right there in a heartbeat for me. Say, boo, they're there. Just like I will do the same thing for them. It's, yeah. We know we're there. Because they, they love you and they want to help. They just need right. to know how. And you asking right. for it is the, a way of showing them how they can help, which is great. Yep. So it's I interesting that you were talking about family dynamics because um, as I was going through, um, I was going through a bunch of quotes about courage when I was thinking about starting this practice. And um, I found one that says it takes a great deal of bravery. This is from JK Rowling who, who wrote the Harry Potter books. It takes a great deal of bravery to stand up to our enemies, but just as much to stand up to our friends. And when I think of that, I think of standing up to your family and not in a very negative way, but um, to show them that you're different or that um, you're capable because those family dynamics, especially you're the baby, so I'm in the middle, um, they kind of assume I'm capable, but it, it, you know, with the baby, I, I remember my sister, Linda, who's the younger, I have an older and a younger, and uh, when she started to drive, I, she was 16, just like I was when I started to drive. And I thought, oh my God, she's too young. She's way too young. She can't possibly <laughs> handle this. <laughs> so I also liked your point about getting out of your own way um, in terms of uh, courage and that sort of thing. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that? What I do is I think I think too much mm. and I talk myself out of something that I want to do, or I think like I had actually said in one of our seven meetings was that um, the greatest gift that seven has given me during the pandemic was that I had to come out of myself and figure out how am I going to survive in my business when I can't be with any of my clients? Yeah. So how am I going to come forward? And so I started doing videos to get myself out there where I would never, ever, have ever thought of me as doing that. I mean, I literally said, no, I would never do this. Yeah. Like that was it. But when you have no choice, you have to get it out of your way and say, no, you need to do this for yourself or you won't survive. And so learning to do that and learning that 
just because I don't have the same book smart as everybody else does not mean I'm not smart. Oh, I may yeah. not be good in certain things, and I've got to learn to ask for help in those things, but it doesn't mean I don't have value to something else. Mm-hmm. I've had to learn that. I mean, I teach that to my daughters, yet I wasn't teaching it to myself. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, I have value and I have to remember I have more value than I think I do. Oh. And I can do things as long as I get myself, my brain out of the way, and <laughs> just do what I need to do. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Well, I can tell you, you are very smart. Oh, I, <laughs> I really enjoy your company. Thank um, you. As, as much as you can, tell everybody what you do for a living and how you, I mean, it's a real transformation because you're an in-person kind of gal. I mean, you, yes. <laughs> tell them what I you am, I am an organizer. What I, and it started out as just plain organizing, helping people declutter, but it's moved on to the fact that I now, um, I help people downsize, I help them pack for moves and unpack for moves. But through this whole process, it's an emotional process for people. And the part of me who is a survivor and as a widow helps to I share my stories, which helps people share their stories, which helps them let go of things that they're holding down. They don't understand why they're holding on to something mm-hmm. and it's weighing them down. And when I've learned to let go of things and move on with things, I feel uplifted. So I do that with my client mm-hmm. and I am not a person from the computer to them because I don't feel like I'm with them. I need to be physically with them. And so I'm working on that. Um, hopefully I'll be able to get back out with my clients soon. I mean, I keep track of them. I, I keep checking in with them every month. I check all my clients, make sure everybody's fine. Everybody's healthy. And whether they're still using me or not, it's just, I want to make sure everybody's fine because I build a relationship with my clients because I want them to know that I'm not there just for their money. You know, I obviously need it to live, but I don't, that's not why I'm there. I'm there to help them find serenity in their space. If you don't have serenity, you're going to be going crazy. It, you can't settle. And that energy just sits on you. You know, my mom used to tell me that when I was in my 20s and I was kind of frantic about, you know, my career and, and you know, whatever was going on. Um, she used to say, tidy your living space, you know, clean your house, put stuff away. Then I realized that she was right. And I actually have a practice on my calendar every week to tidy up my office space. Now it's never fully tidy, but it is more organized every time I take that on. And I feel like, oh man, I'm in control of what's going on here. And I start my day off and I've told my clients this, the best way to start your day is make your bed. You get out of your bed, make your bed. One, you're never going to go back in. That's telling you you're not going back in. You're not going backwards for the day. You are now making your day go forward. So I don't do anything, and it's five in the morning because I'm going to go out walking. I will make my bed first. I love that. I'm not a bed maker, never have been. But the funny thing is I tidy up my bed before I get in it. I'm like, well, do it earlier. <laughs> why not? Yeah, why not do it earlier? And then every time you walk in your room, I'm like, oh, that looks good. And it sounds like with your, um, with your business, where you're helping people let go, I mean, you're, you're kind of teaching courage as well for them to move on with their lives. It is hard for some, it really is hard for a lot of people to let go. And when it's somebody who has been there, I found it easier for them to understand because yeah. to let go of my husband's things or my mother's and father's because they passed, I had all their things too. I said, it just made it easier. So when you share that with them and then they share their story, they can trust you with it. Right. And they know, and then they also think about why they've held on to it. And if it's just an emotional thing that's going to, that's ripping them apart. I'm like, well, why do you want to do that to yourself every day? And that's when it clicks. Cool. Well, that's, I think that's, I think that's it. It was very good. Actually, I think it's very helpful for me while I'm thinking out how to write my book. So this is really great. You know how to write a book? <laughs> I'm writing it with my, so I am working on it, doing my life story as to why I declutter the way I declutter or why I upcycle things that I do. And this way, it's another, hopefully, an avenue to get me, you know, out there again. Yes, yeah, sure. But I, and actually, my oldest one's going to be my ghostwriter. Okay. And I'll, I'm asking my niece to be my editor because she's an editor. Mm-hmm. So I said, keep it in the family and and supporting the females in my family to do something else. So that is a very brave move, Donna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like getting it out there. Like, it sounds worse what I'm doing. Like, wow, did I do that? I'm like, ooh. <laughs> It, it's encouraging to me also because I, I remember things and my kids tell me this actually on every anniversary that I am a survivor 
they put a big thing on Facebook about me, which, or on Father's Day, because I also get me for Father's Day and Mother's Day. Nice. And what my daughters say to me is just makes me, you know, blush and cry. Mm -hmm. And I said, all right, if I can help somebody feel that way, that's what this book's about, to help them understand I had no money, I still have no money, but you can still do things with your life without money. You yep. can find a way to get through anything that life throws at you if you try hard enough. You know, you just got to try not to sink into that low. But if you get in that low, get yourself back out. I mean, not like it's no problem. Right. Get in it, deal with it, go to counseling if you need counseling. Nothing wrong with that. I did counseling. Yep. Do what you need to do and come back out and just find yourself on the other side of that wall. Yep. Take, yeah. Take care of yourself. And, and, you know, joy doesn't cost anything. You can no. decide to bring joy into your day every day, uh, just even for five minutes. If that's not something you, you're used to, you know, I mean, it, it costs nothing. So Right. Take a walk outside for a second. If I don't get up and breathe every day, I'm not here. Well, Donna, thank you so much for being my first guest on Courage Please Rises. <laughs> I, I'm delighted. I mean, all of the stories that you had to tell, I'll probably do a very minor bit of editing on this because every everything you had to say I thought was very interesting and uh, will help people to uh, see the courage and the bravery in your life every day. Okay? Oh, Congratulations you. on a fabulous life. I love spending thank time with you. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you all for joining me for the first episode of Courage Rises. This is Susan Jeffries coming to you from Phoenix, Arizona. If you have thoughts or a practice of your own around courage or bravery, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, let me know, send me a personal message, and um, we'll get together. Thank you. Stay tuned for a new one next week.